Well, this evening, as I've already said, we return to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'd like to go ahead and uh, read it. Um, I, well, okay. Forget what I put on the, uh, <laughs> on the internet sheet, but this is a reminder. I'd like to read for you again uh, verses 1 through 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. This is what Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved." And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast." For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Again, may the Lord bless His Word to our understanding this evening. Now again, this morning we saw that we were not saved by our works. We saw that that was actually an impossibility, seeing that we came into this world spiritually dead, which means not only that we didn't love God, but it means we actually hated Him. We were His adversaries. We were His enemies. We had further shown that by the fact that we aligned ourselves with Satan, the prince of the power of the air, of this world, and were walking after Him. We were fulfilling the desires of our flesh and the lusts of our flesh as we've already read, seeking our own pleasure, seeking our own fame. And because of that, we were under God's wrath. Basically, we were walking with Satan, and so we were going to share the same fate as Satan. Now, in that condition, we didn't really do anything that was acceptable to him because nothing we did was for Him. Everything we did was basically for ourselves. We need to understand that if we are saved here this evening, it wasn't because of anything you did. Clearly, God was the one who saved you, and His motive was purely His own love and mercy. And it had nothing to do with what you had done or what you had felt or what, you know, basically anything was in you because all that was in you was offensive to God. God was the one who turned you around. He was the one who gave you His Spirit, the one you forfeited in the garden because basically you ate of the tree. And again, that's something that uh, maybe we have a hard time understanding, but Adam's representing us in the garden means he took our place and what he did is imputed to us. God looks at us as though we ate of that tree. When we ate of that tree with Adam, we lost the Spirit of God. We lost any ability to please God or to do what was honoring to Him, which means we never could have had any blessedness through Him. But what we forfeited, our Lord Jesus Christ came and restored to us through His life, through His death. It's something He did from first to last. It was part of God's plan. He sent His Son into the world to do this work. He is the one who accomplished it. It is not based upon our works. It is by grace, by God's free gift alone, and it's received by faith alone that it might be by grace alone. Now, again, this morning we saw that the more you understand this, the more useful you will be to the Lord. 
You'll stop working, trying to be good enough for God to accept you, and you'll begin to work for Him out of thankfulness for what He has done. And again, the more you understand what He has done for you, the more thankful you will be so that the more you will put into the work that the Lord calls you to do. Now, this is important because of what we see this evening. You weren't saved by your works. You were saved that you might do good works. Paul writes, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, if you are to be useful to God, you have to see that this is His purpose in redeeming you, and you have to be willing to submit to that purpose because that is His purpose for you. You must be willing to do good works. As a matter of fact, we're going to see you must be willing to do them in in everything you do. You should be offering it to the Lord. Now, what I'd like us to do this evening is consider a couple of different things. Uh, I'd like us to go perhaps beyond just what we see in this text, considering why it is you and I should be doing good works, and I want us to see, secondly, how it is the Lord calls us to do these things. So first of all, why should you do good works? You're not saved by your works, so why do them at all? Well, of course, there's at least five reasons. I'm sure there are many more. Maybe we could find 52 reasons why we should do good works, but I'm sure that wouldn't be difficult to do, really. But let's look at at least five of them. The first one is, that is why the Lord saved you. That was His purpose behind it all, was that you might do good works. As a matter of fact, um, one that just occurs to me that's not in this five is when you do good works, it shows that you are actually saved by Him. It it vindicates His gospel. It also shuts the mouth of Satan. When Satan sees these good works in you, he knows a soul has been saved and redeemed out of his kingdom and brought into God's kingdom. It gives glory to God. But these good works are what the Lord says will be in our lives if we are, as a matter of fact, saved by His grace. I mean, that's what Paul says. That was his purpose in doing it. And there's many other places in Scripture as well. Jesus reminds us in John chapter 15 that He is the vine and we are the branches. I think He's using the analogy, of course, of a grapevine. But the branches are what bear fruit and, of course, the, uh, the vine itself is what gives the life to the branches in order to do that. And if we are connected to the vine, branches that aren't just superficial branches, but branches that really are in Christ. Jesus says, if you are in Him and abiding in Him, you bear much fruit. Again, that's because that's why the Lord redeemed you, is that you might bear this fruit. James tells us that this is how our faith is seen to be genuine faith, real faith, is that there are works. It isn't a barren faith. It's not a dead faith, but it shows itself to be living by the works it produces. Paul writes to Titus, as we saw in our meditation, that Jesus gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. So why should you as a Christian, first of all, do good works? Well, it's because that is why the Lord saved you, that you might do these works, and that by doing these works, you might actually shut the mouths of the adversaries, especially Satan, who would condemn everything that God has to do, and he would see that you are genuinely one of his children as he sees the works of Christ and Christ's nature being formed in you. Now, you should do them secondly because it's the right thing to do. I mean, God made you and uh, He redeemed you. Uh, He certainly has the right, of course, to tell you what to do, but what He tells you to do is right. And as a matter of fact, that's what you want to do. You want to do what is right because God has changed your heart. This was the purpose of His redemption, as we saw in the new members class recently. It was to turn us away from the rebellion that we were in before. 
That's the reason why, of course, we were the children of wrath. Why we were on our way to hell is because we were in rebellion against God. But the Lord sent His Son into the world to break that rebellion, to change our hearts by His Holy Spirit so that we would have the desire to do what is really good and what is really right. So why should you do good works? Well, of course, the first reason is that's the reason why God sent His Son into the world in the first place was to redeem you and to make a people zealous for good works. But secondly, you should do it because you have a new nature, because that's what you want to do. You want to do what is good now. You want to do what is right now. You're no longer rebels against the Lord, but now you are obedient servants. You should want to do them thirdly because this is how you and I show our thankfulness to God. I mean, think about what the Lord has done for you. Uh, you were on your way to hell. As I mentioned in prayer, hell is a very real place. If we were to spend a little time thinking about what hell is like, perhaps it would do a lot to make us more thankful. As a matter of fact, if we could spend even a few moments on, on the precipice, as it were, of hell or over the lake of fire and see what it is that our sins actually deserve and what we actually would have received if the Lord had not turned us around, perhaps we would be more thankful than we are. But hell is where we would have spent, not just a few months or a few years, but we would have been there for all eternity. But the Lord had mercy on you, and He gave you His Spirit, and He opened your eyes, and He turned you away from your rebellion. He forgave you of your sins as you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, those sins that would have weighed you down forever, and He has prepared a place for you in heaven. Instead of burning in hell for eternity, the Lord says that you will get to spend eternity in paradise a place that is far better than anything we could possibly imagine. Anything that we've experienced in this life is nothing compared to what heaven is like. Anything that we could experience in this life, the greatest thrill we could possibly imagine is nothing compared to what heaven is like. And heaven will be swallowed up in that which is perhaps the most enjoyable thing that, that is in this world, especially among the people of God, and that is love. Not the kind of love that we think of that we may have experienced in the world, but the kind of love that comes from the Lord. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, being in a world that is, that is pure love and swallowed up in love, that's what heaven is like. Now, that's just our experience, not to mention the fact we get to see God, who is the most beautiful being, imaginable. Whatever we see in this world we think is beautiful, God is infinitely more so. And to be able to see Him, to see the beatific vision, and to be swallowed up in that love, who can imagine anything better than that? Now, understanding that that's what the Lord is giving to us when we actually deserve to burn in the fire for eternity should make us thankful. And so that's one of the reasons why we should do good works because that is how we answer, as it were, that love He has given to us. I mean, what can we give the Lord in return for what He has done for us? Well, whatever the Lord wants us to do, especially when what He wants us to do is the right thing, it is the loving thing to do, and it's what we already want to do because He's given us the desire by His Holy Spirit so the third reason we should do good works is because this is how we show the Lord how thankful we are for all that He has done for us. Now you should do good works fourthly because this is how the Lord actually moves His kingdom forward. I mean, let's think about what it is that God has actually done for us in allowing us to do what He's actually called us to do, to do these good works. I mean, the Lord theoretically, could have done everything that He asked us to do, He could have done it Himself. I mean, He could have written the gospel in the sky for everyone to see. He could have put it in the minds of, of every individual so that there was nothing more for us to do. Or He could have sent His angels out 
to announce the gospel. But that's not what he determined to do. Instead, he wanted to give that honor and that privilege of bringing the good news to others. He wanted to give that to us. Now, we do understand that our audience may not necessarily see it as good news. They may actually not like that message, but that doesn't mean that it isn't good news. I mean, you know, we all like to share good news, don't we? We like to tell people interesting news, and especially when it's good news and when it has to do with them, uh, it's exciting. It's usually exciting for the people who receive it, and we like to be the bearers of good news and not bad news. Well, this is the best news that we could possibly tell anyone that God is willing to forgive sins. He's willing to basically give a perfect righteousness to everyone who will trust in His Son so that they won't have to go to hell but will actually be able to enjoy the same things we're looking forward to in heaven. I mean, can you think of a better message or better news than that news? That is the only message of its kind. And it's the only gospel or the only good news that the Lord uses to bring about these results, to bring about this salvation. And the Lord has actually reserved the privilege of sharing that good news to us. He's entrusted it to us so that we can share it by word, we can share it by life. That is a great privilege. So why should we do good works? Well, it's because this is the way that God advances His kingdom. This is, a matter of fact, the only way that He advances His kingdom. And because it's a great privilege that the Lord has given to us to be able to do this, to be able to be the bearers of such good news. And then also we need to realize that we should do it because if we don't do it and we are the ones He's entrusted with this work, then the kingdom of heaven isn't going to move forward. This is the means and it's a great privilege. We need to do it because we are the ones called to do it. And again, don't forget, it's a privilege to be called to this. And then finally, with regard to why should we do good works, and, and by good works, I mean, those are the things that God commands us to do. It includes sharing the gospel, but living a life that is consistent with the gospel so that we don't take away from it, but rather add to it. What is the fifth reason why we should do this? Well, because this is how you and I can gain honor and riches for ourselves. Now, we know that the Lord has told us not to seek the fame that comes from this world, not to seek the fortune or the riches that are in this world. If we do that, if we try to do that, I mean, first of all, if we're the Lord's, He won't let us have them. We need to understand that to begin with because He loves us too much. But if we actually did, if we we're able to do so, not only would we lose everything that we gain in this world, as one of our hymns that we sing from time to time tells us that, you know, the, the riches and honor He gives us are going to last far beyond anything that the world has to give when, was it, victors' wreaths and monarchs' gems blend in common dust. Everything in this world that we might possibly gain, one day we have to lose it all, and one day the world's going to be burned up and it's all going to be gone. So whatever we may gain, we are going to lose in the end. And of course, if that's all we want, we may lose our souls as well, as Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. But the fact that we are not to seek honor and riches in this world doesn't mean that we cannot seek them somewhere else. We can and we should seek those honors that the Lord has to give in heaven. Jesus actually commands us to store up treasures in heaven. He's talking, I believe, about rewards. And He tells us not to seek the honor that comes from man, but to seek the honor that comes from God. Now, that's a command, which means that we are authorized to seek that honor and those riches. Now, how do we do that? We do it through good works. Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, that God 
is going to render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that uh, God has laid a foundation through the gospel, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that each person who has trusted in Him needs to be careful how they build on that foundation, not with worthless things, but rather with gold, silver, and precious stones, which are the good works of the saints. And he says that on the day when we stand before the Lord, He will reward us for the things that we have done which are actually praiseworthy in the Lord. So good works are how we store up treasures. Good works are how we receive honor. And the more you do for Him, the more He will give you on that day. So basically, if you give up the things that the Lord tells you to give up and you seek the things that the Lord tells you to seek, you're not going to lose anything because you're only giving up what you can't keep to gain what you can keep forever. Now again, good works... This is why the Lord saved you. This is what He has changed your heart so that you want to do it. This is how you show your thankfulness to Him. This is how He advances the kingdom of heaven. This is how you ultimately become rich and famous in a way that you get to hold on to throughout eternity. So this is why you should do good works. Secondly, I think we should understand something about how to do good works in a way that the Lord will actually accept them. And again, we might come up with several reasons, um, or at least several ways to do this, but I want to focus on just four quickly. In order to do good works in a way that would be honoring to the Lord, obviously we need to do it God's way. You'd think that'd be a sort of a no-brainer, but uh, we sometimes miss the point, right? Because too often, as we set out to seek the Lord, we think about things that we want to do rather than what the Lord actually tells us that He wants to do. We do that in worship, in, in at least churches do, in, in public worship, but we also do it in worship more broadly. You know, Lord, the Lord says, I want you to do this, this, and this, and you think, well, you know, it doesn't look like it's that much fun. I'd rather do this, this, and this. And so maybe you spend time doing those things and you think somehow God is going to accept it because it's something you want to do rather than what He wants you to do, but that's not the way it works. If you want to do something that He's going to recognize and accept and reward as a good work, you not only need to do what He says, but you do need to do it in the way that He tells you to do it. And that's, again, something we're going to look at in just a moment. God has given us plenty to do, more than we could possibly do in our entire lifetime. We don't have to think of new things to do. If we just simply stick to the things He has told us in worship, we will honor Him. If we stick to the things He's told us to do in life, we will honor Him, and He will honor us. So the Lord has told us plainly in His Word what He wants us to do. Secondly, the things He tells us to do, we need to do all the time, and not just in our spare time. Now here I think, again, sometimes we miss the point of what Jesus means when He tells us we need to pick up our crosses and follow Him. He doesn't mean that do what you want to with your life, you know, pursue the goals that you desire, just seek your pleasure and your fame and all, whatever it is, and then if you have any spare time, give it to me. Now, that's not what the Lord means when He says, pick up your cross and follow Him. What He means is you need to set your own life aside entirely and serve Him with all your time. Serve Him with all your talents. Serve Him with all your resources. Does that mean that the Lord wants you to quit your job and go on the mission field? Well, maybe, if that's what the Lord is actually calling you to do. But in most cases, not necessarily. What He wants you to do is to serve Him where you are, as best you can, 
with what it is He has called you to do. And of course, the Lord will show you if He wants you to move from that. He says in Scripture that when you're serving your master, or in our case today, when you're employed and you're serving your employer, you do the best job that you can for the Lord and not necessarily for your employer. You try to uh, serve Him, try to love Him and serve the people with whom you work and try to reach out to them with the gospel. Now, if you don't yet have a calling, if you're still young and you're wondering, well, what does the Lord want me to do with my life? Then what you need to do is figure out what are the gifts that God has given to you and how can they best be applied uh, to His work and go that direction. But the Lord would have you to serve Him in your work. He would have you to serve Him in, well, in your family life, in your relationships. He would have you to serve Him with your whole life, even in your recreations, that you do what you need to do with regard to recreation in order that you might better serve the Lord and not that you make recreation an end in itself. We have to uh, bear in mind that perhaps one of the greatest pitfalls that we have in, in our culture, in our society is that there is there's a lot of free time and there's a lot of fun things to do and you could very easily become enslaved to those fun things, become a slave to recreation and try to basically live to get as much of that as you can and do as little work as you can, that's not the way the Lord wants it. He wants us to use the recreation so that we will have the strength we need to do the work He has called us to do, that we might be rich in good works. We need to do all that we do for His glory and not just serve Him in our spare time, but serve Him in everything, everything that we do, we need to do for His glory. Thirdly, when we do these things, as we've been reminded by Paul as he writes to Titus, you need to do them with your whole heart and not half-heartedly. I think if there's anything that bugs an employer, it's having an employee that does just enough to get by, but who isn't really doing the best job that they possibly can. The question we need to ask ourselves is when God looks at us doing our work, when He looks at how we're living our lives for His glory, what does He see? Does He see us putting our best efforts into serving Him? An effort that answers to the love and the mercy that He has actually shown us. Now, we know that there's really nothing we're ever going to do in this world that could ever possibly answer to what God has done for us. We understand that. But I'll wager that we can put more effort into it than we currently are. Now, we, there's, there's kind of a, a catch here. We need to make sure that we don't kill ourselves and break the sixth commandment in trying to do what the Lord has called us to do. You know, it's, it is possible that we can ruin our constitution a little bit too quickly you know, maybe if we sort of, you know, plan for the long haul, we can actually get more. But if we can get more by putting more into it initially, and we need to do that, if that's what the Lord has called us to do, then we need to do it. But we need to be zealous. We need to be wholeheartedly serving the Lord. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 that we are not to lag behind in diligence, but to be fervent in spirit because we are serving the Lord. He writes to Titus that the Lord redeemed us so that we would be zealous for good works, not that we would do them now and again or in our spare time or do what we want to do, hoping that God will just simply accept what we're doing and really not do what He wants us to do. He wants us to do what He has called us to do, and He wants us to do it all the time, and He wants us to be zealous for those works, to put our best efforts into it because it is the Lord that we are serving. Now, finally, in how we do these things, we need to make sure that when we do what God has called us to do, that we do it in a way that glorifies Him and not ourselves. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And he goes on to say in Matthew 6, verse 1, 
Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Reminds us that it's possible to do what is right, but have the wrong motives. And if our motive is simply to draw attention to ourselves, then that attention is all that we're going to get out of it. The Lord wants us to do as much as possible to do what we do for Him in a way that He alone sees it. And what He sees in secret, the Lord says, He will reward. So again, the Lord has saved us for good works. He saved us in order that we might serve Him. And so we should seek to do what the Lord calls us to do. Seek to serve Him with our whole life, with our whole heart, with in, in everything that we do, and to seek to do it in a way that He alone receives the glory for it and we don't get any of it. Now, if we do that, not only will the Lord use us to advance the kingdom, but He also says that He will reward us. We will have treasure in heaven. We will have honor that comes from the Father, honor that we get to keep when the Lord finally brings us to heaven. Now, what kind of person is the Lord looking for? Well, He's looking, first of all, for a person who doesn't trust in his own works, but is trusting in the work of His Son only to save him, is thankful for that mercy, and out of that thankfulness gives his whole life to serve the Lord. He is looking for someone who is zealous to serve Him and not zealous to serve themselves. So let's seek to be by His grace what it is that the Lord calls us to be, zealous for Him and for His works. Well, let's spend just a couple moments in prayer and let's ask that the Lord might graciously help us to do this.